Thank you so much. And as many of you might know, I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio area. My family still lives there. My sister is there. So Cleveland has a special place in my heart and soul, and I can never pass up an opportunity to be able to reconnect with colleagues and friends in Cleveland. So thank you for this opportunity virtually to be able to talk a little bit about babies with Down syndrome. Uh, thank you for taking care of them. It definitely is a joint team effort. And during this talk, we're gonna go through some of those important recommendations. Here are my disclosure statements. I am lucky enough to be able to participate in several research opportunities and nonprofit organizations, many of which you heard mentioned in my introduction. During this online talk, um, I hope in the next hour we cover three things. What is the science of prenatal testing? Many of you straggle that prenatal side and that postnatal side. I wanna make sure everyone understands what's the latest. And then what is the art of delivering a prenatal or postnatal diagnosis of Down syndrome? So many of us are there in those first moments when the diagnosis is given and how best, what is the evidence-based practices for delivering those news? And then once we have a newborn with Down syndrome here, what is the up-to-date medical evaluation that should be in place? I'm gonna talk for about 50, 55 minutes to get through these three goals, and then I'll reserve space at the end for your questions and your comments. So let's jump right in. Many of you know that genetically Down syndrome has three different genetic types. The most type being trisomy 21, where you have three copies rather than two copies of chromosome 21. There is translocation Down syndrome where that extra copy of chromosome 21 is attached to a different chromosome, here being chromosome 14 on this karyotype. And mosaic Down syndrome means some cells, but not all cells have three copies of chromosome 21. And depending upon which cells and how many cells will determine what is the phenotypic characteristics of individuals with mosaic Down syndrome. Still remains the most common chromosomal condition that we see in our live births with nearly 5,000 children born every year and 217,000 families in the United States having a loved one with Down syndrome. Many of our families, when they have a child with Down syndrome, have already had a prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome and come either with a high suspicion that their baby will have Down syndrome or a definitive diagnosis prior to birth. And I just wanna review what the options are because we're gonna see those being discussed and it's important to stay on top of the evolving science. There's prenatal screens and there's prenatal diagnosis. So prenatal screen is gonna give us a statistical chance that a fetus has has Down syndrome, but will not say for sure yes or no. The result of any of these prenatal screens will give us a number. You have a one in 30, you have a one in 400, you have a one in 2000 chance that your fetus has Down syndrome. And it could be the triple screen, the quadruple screen, the first trimester combined screen. If someone wants a definitive diagnosis prenatally, as definitive as they come in medicine, nearly a 99.9%, .9%, you need an invasive procedure, and that's chorionic villus sampling or CVS performed in the first trimester, or amniocentesis traditionally performed in the second trimester. Since both of those are invasive, if the needle is in the wrong place at the wrong time, there is a small, although real chance of causing a procedure-related miscarriage, and depending upon how much an operator does do that depends on what is their own personal chance of causing that spontaneous termination. About 72% of pregnant persons in the United States are now pursuing one of the prenatal screening options, and about 2% of pregnant persons and their partners will go on to pursue one of these prenatal diagnostic tests. As many as you know, the landscape changed in October of 2011 when there was a new prenatal screening option that was added to the menu. This is known as cell-free DNA test or non-invasive prenatal screening test or NIPS. The way this works is we know, of course, the fetus through the umbilical cord and the placenta is connected to the maternal bloodstream. And as a medical geneticist, when I was back in medical school, I had learned all the genes are in a nucleus in our cells. But what still amazes me today is we have fragments of DNA that are not in the nucleus, just free floating throughout our circulation. And if you look at this illustration here represented in green are little itsy bitsy fragments of maternal DNA that are floating in mom's circulation. Researchers were able to learn that itsy bitsy fragments from the placenta, which is oftentimes, although not always representative of the fetal genetic composition, are also free floating throughout the maternal circulation because that placental circulation interdigitates, if you will, with the maternal circulation. And we have now decoded the whole human genome. And so if we find a fragment of DNA in our bodies, we could decode it and figure out, 
oh, this fossil, if you will, comes from chromosome two, or this segment comes from chromosome four, or chromosome 18. And the way this technology works is you take a simple blood draw from a mom who might be pregnant, and you find these itsy bitsy fragments of DNA and you simply decode them and you count them up. So if you find a little itsy bitsy fragment from chromosome 18, you put it in the chromosome 18 bucket. If you find a little bit of itsy bitsy fragment from chromosome 21, you put it in the chromosome 21 bucket. And the hypothesis is if you have a fetus with Down syndrome, there should be an overabundance of material from chromosome 21 when you count the fetus and the mother's circulation uh, DNA together. This has proven to be highly effective. And you could see on the prenatal screening menu that I have here, I've placed non-invasive prenatal screening tests kind of between screening and diagnostic. It's a super duper screening test, but as all of our medical organizations remind us, if one gets a positive result on a non-invasive prenatal screening test, the recommendation is to confirm with a CVS or amniocentesis, particularly if our pregnancy determination is being considered because there are high chances of false positives on these results. Non-invasive prenatal screening tests, however, has such a high negative predictive value that a negative result on one of those tests can lead to someone stopping and not having to pursue additional testing throughout their pregnancy, although there are always false positives and false negatives as well. People have asked me, okay, with all of the prenatal testing out there, what does this mean for the number of babies that are being born, the number of babies you might be seeing in your NICU and your newborn nurseries? My colleagues and I have had an opportunity to stitch together the public databases that are available in the United States, which we update each year. It takes about five years for the data to come out. You can see we've been tracking in our country from 1974 to 2016, the number of fetuses with Down syndrome that go on to have a natural miscarriage, that go on to be selectively terminated or go on to live birth. The total length of these bars represent the number of fetuses at 10 weeks gestation. And the reason why those bars are increasing over time is because pregnant persons are waiting until they're older and advanced maternal age leads to an increased number of fetuses with Down syndrome as we know. The light blue bars at the top represent the number of natural miscarriages, which has remained nearly constant over time. And the dark blue bars represent the number of live births with Down syndrome. That leaves the orange bars to represent the selective terminations or abortions specifically because of the diagnosis of Down syndrome. With the latest data, we have about 5,100 live births with Down syndrome and about 3,900 selective terminations for Down syndrome in the United States. My colleagues and I can then do a calculation where we say if theoretically there were no selective terminations, that is these orange bars didn't exist, how many of these orange bars would have gone on as cases naturally to be a miscarriage versus gone on to a live birth? So if there were no abortions in the United States, rather than having 5,100 babies with Down syndrome, there would be about 8,000 babies with Down syndrome in the United States. This allows us to calculate the epidemiological number called a reduction rate. How many fewer babies are born with a genetic condition than could have been born as a consequence of selective terminations? And with Down syndrome, that is 36%, according to the latest data in the United States. Put simply, there are 36% fewer babies with Down syndrome than could have been born in the United States as a consequence of selective terminations. We know that there are regional differences when it comes to reduction percentages. The reduction percentage specific to Down syndrome is highest in the Northeast and lowest in the South. The state that has the highest reduction percentage for Down syndrome is Hawaii, and it's believed to align with the racial and ethnic differences, with Asian Pacific Islanders being the most likely to reduce um, a, a pregnancy with Down syndrome, and Hispanic and American Indians being the least likely. That probably has a lot to be correlated with either access to care or personal choices related to care that might be correlated with personal beliefs and or religious beliefs. What does this then mean with the number of terminations that are taking place in the United States for the number of people overall? So sometimes we hear statistics in the media, oh, people with Down syndrome are disappearing and all of these terminations 
But what we have to take into account is people with Down syndrome who are born are living longer than they've ever lived before. And that's because of those of you in the NICU who are taking care of babies with Down syndrome, you have reduced the infant mortality down very small. And thanks to all of our colleagues in internal medicine and in geriatric medicine, people with Down syndrome are now living long, meaningful, healthy lives with the average lifespan now approaching 60. When you look at this data, which we've stitched together from 1950 to 2016, these are the number of people with Down syndrome of all ages alive in the United States. And it is clear from the bar graphs, the numbers continue to rise with the latest data representing nearly 217,000 people with Down syndrome in the United States. And that's because we have more 50 year olds, more 40 year olds, more 30 year olds. They're living longer than they lived in yesteryear. It is not because there's an increase in the number of new babies that has remained relatively constant, as you could see here in the zero to four category. There could have been more babies, as we've talked about, but the consequence of potentially more babies reduced by selective terminations had led that constant. So these facts of, yes, there are more selective terminations. Yes, the number of newborn babies has remained constant, and yet there are more people with Down syndrome ever before all of those facts can coexist as epidemiology brings all of those into play. And I wanted you to have these numbers as a backdrop because they have implications for how many people with Down syndrome we're seeing and how we play a role as medical providers in making sure that our families get accurate and up-to-date information. Many of us are involved in having that conversation, revealing the diagnosis of Down syndrome either prenatally if we are involved in the prenatal consultation or the postnatal setting. And I wanna go through now the second objective of this talk, and that is the art of communicating the science of Down syndrome. So we've talked about how someone could get a prenatal diagnosis, but once they get that through maybe a non-invasive prenatal screening test confirmed with amnio, and we have those results, how best to deliver that diagnosis in a way that is um, compassionate and also accurate. So I had an opportunity with colleagues to do a literature review where we looked at all the research and said, what does the evidence tell us? How have families been saying that they want to receive this news? So if a family were to choose one of those prenatal screening options, remember those one in something options, the families have said very clearly they don't want the risk explained as a positive or a negative result. They simply want their number so they can interpret what to do with their number themselves. How well are we doing right now? Only 35% of us who practice in this realm are really giving just the numerical value. 23% are still using low risk or high risk. The word risk itself has a lot of value in in there. We avoid things that are risky. Just using the word risk may or may not confirm or conform with the value system of the couple we're talking to. So in our effort to practice culturally sensitive, neutral, compassionate care, it's important to think about the words we use because they can have profound influence. About 50% of us are saying normal or abnormal. An abnormal result suggests that the diagnosis is abnormal, Down syndrome is abnormal, and the couple on the receiving ends of the news may or may not feel the same. And so it's important to allow them to be able to interpret the numbers as they request it. And positive or negative, a negative result sounds negative, therefore the diagnosis is negative. And so being able to allow the couple to receive receive the news in a neutral way so that they can be able to bring their own cultural value system to the table is very important. Number two, prior to a CVS or amniocentesis, it's important that we discuss all reasons for a prenatal diagnosis. We know that today's modern day pregnant person and or the partner may want to get a prenatal diagnosis in order to line up all the resources to get ready to be read and to connect with other families because they want to continue that pregnancy and they want to learn in advance. Then there are other couples who want to know that information in advance because they do not want to have a child with Down syndrome and they want to select determination. There is a third option that sometimes is not always appreciated, and that is there are families who want to get a prenatal diagnosis, not to, con not to raise the child themselves, but to offer the child up for adoption. And there is a National Down Syndrome Adoption Network, and on any given day, there's about 300 plus families in the United States 
waiting to adopt a distinctively uh, a child with Down syndrome. And for many uh, uh, pregnant couples, this could be a very viable option. Number three and four go together, and that is the healthcare professional most knowledgeable about Down syndrome should be delivering that prenatal result. And most likely it's the OB and the genetic professional together. You know, I hear from so many in the OB world that, you know, I'm really good at obstetric care, but I don't follow the children. I don't know what they grow up to. I don't know life with those conditions. Where the pediatricians, the developmental specialists, the Down syndrome specialists in your backyard, they really know people with Down syndrome, but they're oftentimes not involved in those prenatal discussions. The art of medicine is so much better when we have an opportunity to practice together and pregnancy is an opportunity for lots of different disciplines to come together. So ideally, when we have a result we're gonna present, it would be the person who's the trusted messenger, the OB professional they've been working with, but also joining them for that conversation would be someone who is very knowledgeable about Down syndrome, whether it's your Down syndrome specialist, a developmental behavioral pediatrician, or a geneticist at your hospital. Now, many, many, many people are getting one of these new tests, and so it is unreasonable to invite everyone back, wait in line, get parking, go through the waiting room, wait to see us, only to find that 99% of them are going to have a result suggestive not for Down syndrome. Why did you drag me and why did I have to come? You could have just given me these results over the phone, right? Well, maybe we'll just call those who get the prenatal result for Down syndrome. Well, now, if you get the phone call, you know you're the one, right? So now the advances of technology have forced us to be able to have this disclosure conversation over the phone or over telemedicine rather than in person like we used to. And so the stakes have changed. And what we have heard from couples who have been in this situation is that cold calls don't work. There was a mother who remembers pulling down a can of carbonzo beans at her local grocery store where she had been shopping for the past 10 years. She picked up the phone. It was the assistant to the OB who said, Dr. So-and-so just wanted you to know the results came back for Down syndrome. We wanted you to know right away. This woman said she froze. She could not find the exit in her grocery store, even though she had been shopping there for 10 years. It was a cold call. There was another um, expectant uh, mother who described that she was a teacher at the time and she overheard on the loudspeaker, please come to the principal's office, you have an important phone call. She left her class, she went to the principal's office, she picked up the phone, it was the genetic counselor who said, you have a result indicating Down syndrome. She said, how was I supposed to go back to teaching my class? Cold calls don't work, but planned and scheduled calls do. So when we are ordering tests with an expectant couple, let's contract with them. Let's say, okay, you're ordering this test. I know it takes about three days. So on Thursday at two o'clock, can I give you a phone call? Now at two o'clock, I got to pick up my other kid from baseball practice. Okay, Thursday at four o'clock, would that work? Yes, that will work. So therefore Wednesday when the phone rings, uh, that person is not jumping. Thursday at 8 a.m., she's not scared. Thursday around four o'clock, that pregnant person and or her partner will put herself in the situation where she wants to receive that phone call. She might be at home, her partner might pick up on the other line or not pick up on the other line. Certainly, you know, the in-laws are nowhere to be found. She is in the setting where she wants to receive that news. And then when we make that phone call, we will say at the beginning, this is so-and-so, um, is this still a good time to talk? Yes. I have the results. Do you want to hear them at this moment? Yes. And then those first words are going to matter. And if there's temptation, I get it to say, I'm sorry to have to tell you, or unfortunately I have some bad news. But again, those are value statements that might not resonate and or syncopate with the person we're talking to. And we need to give them the ability to process and to situate it within their own cultural framework. And so we simply say the facts. The results came back showing that your fetus has Down syndrome. The results came back showing a high chance that your fetus has Down syndrome. And then there is the pause. And one thing I continue to need to learn myself about the art of medicine is we like to like build things in, we like to talk, we like to like not have negative spaces, but sometimes having negative spaces, having that pause is what is the most therapeutic. And giving that space, because we've had these results since 8 a.m., but and we've done this probably you know, 10, 20 times over the past month, but this is the first moment for them. 
And we've also learned from the research literature, this is going to be a flashball memory for them. What is a flashball memory? Our neurologists have said those are events in our life that are so salient, so poignant, perhaps so traumatic, that we remember minute details we wouldn't ordinarily remember. Where were you when 9-11 happened? Most people could say, I remember I was here, I remember I called this, and this is what I did, right? I remember those moments. If you ask people who were close victims of 9-11, they can recall with remarkable detail what it was like. The research has now been done. There are researchers who studied um, mothers who have gotten a prenatal or postnatal diagnosis of Down syndrome. And what they recall from that initial conversation is more of a flashball memory than those who experienced 9-11. It is more of a 9-11 moment. So what we say, how we say it, how much we pause, is going to be remembered for a lifetime. And there is a great privilege of being able to be invited into that conversation, but a lot of practice that needs to go into trying to practice this evidence base. And so after that pause happens, we are going to take questions. I let the person on the other end run that agenda. What is going through their mind? But somewhere during that conversation, I like to get in the answers to these three questions that seem to come up and are asked by pregnant persons over and over again. What is Down syndrome? What causes the condition? I like to remind everyone there's nothing they did to cause Down syndrome it is naturally occurring. It's not that they slipped or something they did in college or something they ate last week. And the number six is the real tough one, but perhaps the most important one. What does it mean to have a child with Down syndrome? What does it mean to raise this child? And unless we have worked with a lot of individuals with Down syndrome, most of us don't have an evidence-based answer to that. But what expected couples have said in the research literature is if we connect them to a local Down syndrome organization, if we give them the phone number, the lifeline, and say, you know, I don't know, but here's this group you could call to be able to learn a lot from, whether or not they ever make that phone call, whether or not they ever check out that website is up to them. But in return, they will thank us and say the way we practice the art of medicine was better because we made that realistic link. We want to make sure we use non-directive language as much as possible, again, respecting their own opportunity to infuse with their own cultural value systems. And when they're done, they're going to go to Dr. Google. So we want to say after that conversation, can I send you a link with some materials? Can I send you a link with up-to-date information? And then we're going to then invite them in to say, now that we've had this phone call, can you come in tomorrow so we could talk about this further and discuss your options and what you would like to do? You might be thinking, what about those babies who don't have a prenatal diagnosis? And maybe some of you joining in the newborn nursery or their NICU, you have these. You have these opportunities to make a postnatal diagnosis of Down syndrome. And this is the best evidence on how we do it in this situation. In this situation, we have a baby in front of us, and how we deliver that news will make a difference. And the flashball memory is so poignant here. There was a study that was done that asked parents, okay, can you write down on a piece of paper the first words that the clinical team used when they gave you that diagnosis in the newborn nursery? And they wrote it down. The same researchers came back 10 years later, found the same people in those study, gave them a blank sheet of paper and said, write down the words that your physician used. With 88% accuracy, they wrote word for word the first sentences that we use. They will remember what you're wearing, how you said it, what you said it, and what the setting is. So the stakes are high and we can make it a really um, good and uplifting experience, an empowering experience while being factually honest, or we could really have a negative uh, flashball memory that is oftentimes very difficult for families to overcome over a lifetime. So again, OBs and pediatricians must work together. Oftentimes the OBs birth the child and they say, oh, clearly the child has Down syndrome. The pediatricians will take care of it. The pediatricians will say the OBs must have said something and no one's saying anything. So we need to make sure within our hospital we're coordinating that news, who says what and how do they say it. Parents have oftentimes said there is this silent period. You know, where you're checking out that baby, it looks like has Down syndrome, but I don't want to say anything. I want to get someone else. Can you just go in and take a look? And everyone's going in and taking a look. Parents say this is so frustrating. It adds salt onto the wounds of this complication. It's a silent period. We know how to make a diagnosis of Down syndrome based on our clinical exam. We do not need to secretly wait for that karyotype to come back in nearly all cases before we share our suspicions. Families are asking us, if you see my child born, 
please involve us in that diagnostic odyssey because the silent treatment, we know something is up and we're not getting a straight answer um, is too much. When we are gonna have that conversation, having a private room, many of our rooms in our hospital are divided by a curtain, having the courtesy to go to a place where we're gonna have this diagnosis so that couple could experience the emotions they want to experience in private makes a difference. If there is more than one parent in a circumstance, we wanna make sure they're informed together. I still hear about partners who email me who said, you know, I was pulled aside and the doctor said to me, you know, your son has Down syndrome, but you know your wife, you know your partner best. So when you feel it's best, just you tell them how you think it's best. And the husband of the partner says, it's as much of a shock to me as to anyone, right? And if the person is not there and we're giving the diagnosis and then they come two hours later because they were stuck in traffic, we have to do it again because we're the ones that have that information and we can't give a diagnosis and then put the burden on one partner to then have to hold that and explain it to the other partner. So having the parents together really makes a difference. Now we have a baby and all parents love to hear their baby's names we found in research. And so when we're addressing and talking, we wanna make sure the baby is there in the room. We wanna make sure Michael is there, Omalar is there. We want to, as often as possible, refer to that baby by name because it humanizes their baby and reminds them um, what we're all about. First, words matter. And again, the temptation might be, uh, uh, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, or I don't know how to say this, or unfortunately, I think we have bad news. We think it's Down syndrome. No. We could start, the baby is healthy, the baby is fine. We could start by saying, congratulations, you've just had a child. Every parent wants to hear those words, congratulations. Ah, oh, you know, Omalar is so beautiful. Look at that curly hair. Where'd you get that curly hair from, right? Then we could start to weave in. I also noticed that Omalara has a single crease across her palm, and I know that her eyes are upward slanting. Because of these features, I feel that Omalara has Down syndrome. Pause. This is where we have that pause again to allow the couple to be able to appreciate. I am not saying, congratulations, she has Down syndrome. Congratulations, you've had a child. Um, she's so beautiful. Here are the authentic ways she's beautiful. And then we deliver the diagnosis in neutral words and we give space for the couple to be able to react to that. And even after doing this for 20 plus years, there is no consistent way that couples react. They're all going to react in their own way. And then we meet them and we take them from there. We're gonna make sure that we follow up with accurate up-to-date information. And now is not the time just to regurgitate every fact we've learned about Down syndrome. You know, now's not the time to mention, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, they have Alzheimer's when they get older. But wait, 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 um, research is great nowadays, right? We just need to talk about the here and now. The baby is here. We have a lifetime to be able to keep that baby healthy together. And we could talk about all those other medical conditions at a later time. Again, one point that parents will say, they will rate us in our, in our evaluations as doing a great job is whether or not we have given them the link to that local parent support group. Do they know who to call or how to call if they want to call and when they want to call? And it's really important, no matter what genetic condition you might have in your newborn nursery or NICU, just do a quick Google search, find a local group. That means the world to parents because we know parent to parent support is as important, if not more important, than clinician to parent support. And then we're gonna have the follow-up appointments as we need arranged and desired. Um, so that is the recommendations for the postnatal. For those of you who would like to practice this, or for those of you who are in a teaching or a mentorship role and you have students or trainees, here is a great website I'd like to call to your attention, brighter-tomorrows.org, it's been tested in the medical journals with residents uh, on both the OBGYN and pediatric side. Well, what happens is they get an online free simulation. You have a pregnant couple who is here, or you could choose the postnatal model where this actor couple has a baby with Down syndrome. Then it pauses. What would you say next? Then it continues. Then the couple starts crying. Then you get, you know, clammy hands at home. What are you gonna do? Better to practice at home before you go for prime time. And this is a free module that's great. I also want to share with you what are all the resources and materials that are out there. You don't need to create a new pamphlet. You don't need to create a new website because the gold standard information has been created. And I want to walk you through what's available. 
So understanding a Down syndrome diagnosis is available through lettercase.org. This is the prenatal information that's available for couples who have not yet made a pregnancy decision whether to continue terminate or offer up for adoption. What I like about this uh, material is not just parent propaganda. This has been carefully reviewed and re-reviewed by the major medical organizations and the Down syndrome organizations. So much hard work has gone into this. And I have been involved in this at several parts along the way. And one thing I appreciate is how much attention has been given to the vocabulary, but also the photos. What we've learned from pregnant couples in focus groups is they want a voyeuristic peek, if you will, at Down syndrome. When they were shown photos of individuals with Down syndrome looking straight at them, they were less likely to open the book because they thought that the children were perhaps judging them. And the booklets were more likely to be read, more likely to be flipped through, the information more likely to be digested when the eyes and the, the gaze of everyone with Down syndrome was off camera. So even the photos were carefully calibrated to make it as sensitive, usable, and digestible, and ultimately readable for the expectant couples. And so it's uh, been very carefully calibrated, um, and you can find out lettercase.org. We also know many of us practice um, with patients with multiple languages. It's been translated into these languages. It's digital and it's free. And you could go to understandingdownsyndrome.org. Now that's the information for couples who haven't yet made a decision about their pregnancy. Let's talk about those couples who then decide to continue a pregnancy. Here is the booklet, everything a couple needs to know between now and delivery. So it's a pregnant mother's guide. There's so much on the internet, but it breaks it down to just what they need to know right now. Then there is how do you tell your mother-in-law? How do you tell your coworkers? Rather than having to now bear the burden of explaining the diagnosis, no longer you just need to download this ebook and send it to your colleagues. I've had so many couples just send it to all their coworkers saying, here's what you need to read. Here's the answers to all the questions. Here's how you can continue to be an awesome friend to us educate yourself first. And then for those of you in the pediatric side or the newborn nursery side, this is the book I like to give to parents after a child was born, everything you need to know for the first month. You know, when you talk about the whole lifespan, it just seems too big, but let's break it down to the first month. And this is all the great information in there. Now there are going to be expecting couples who lose a fetus with Down syndrome through a miscarriage. And oftentimes those are wanted and expected pregnancies. They need to know they are not alone. And this is a great book about coping with loss um, and experience in miscarriage. All of this is on this website, downsyndromediagnosis.org, in one convenient place for you to check it out. Next, I want to turn, as promised, to the next objective in this talk is to say, now that we've given that diagnosis, we have a baby with Down syndrome in our newborn nurseries or in our NICUs. What do we need to do to make sure that that baby is getting the best medical care? I am happy to share, if you didn't uh, see already, the American Academy of Pediatrics updated their guidelines for the healthcare supervision for people with Down syndrome this year, and the next slides in my talk is gonna be consistent with and updated with those guidelines. We at Mass General Hospital have created a quick check sheet just to make it easy for all of those uh, physicians who practice in the newborn setting. If this, this could be helpful for you, feel free to download it. It's free. It's basically the checklist of what we should do when a baby is born so we don't miss anything. And in the next uh, section of my slides, I'm going to walk you through what that is. First, let's talk about confirming the diagnosis. If the baby has had a, self, has had a, a prenatal screening test or a cell-free DNA test, but has not had a CVS or amniocentesis, then we need to confirm that. But if they have had a CBS or amniocentesis, they have a karyotype with that, and we don't need to repeat the genetic testing, right? So if you see a baby that has a CBS or amniocentesis, we don't need to repeat the karyotype. If, however, there, it's a new postnatal diagnosis, then we want to do that confirmatory testing. What is that confirmatory testing? There's two tests you want to order, as many of you know. A FISH test is really just painting chromosomes. That's going to give us a quick and dirty answer within 48 hours. That will tell us whether or not the diagnosis of Down syndrome is there so we can deliver that confirmatory diagnosis, which so many parents hold on to. But a karyotype is still important. That's going to come about five to seven days later because that's going to confirm the genetic subtype. We already know they have Down syndrome from the FISH, 
but I'll distinguish whether it's trisomy 21 translocation or mosaicism, since translocation can have implications since it could be inherited and passed along. It's important to use Down syndrome specific growth curves when we're seeing um, children in our newborn nurseries. And if you don't have those available already, you could go to this website or search CDC growth curves for Down syndrome to make sure we're using those. Breastfeeding is so important for all of our babies, including babies with Down syndrome. Since babies with Down syndrome will have generalized hypotonia or low muscle tone, sometimes it's difficult at first to have that latch but please encourage parents not to give up. And you know, we couldn't and we wouldn't do it without our lactation specialists in our hospital. We have created this handout, which again, you could see the URL at the bottom of my screen. You are more than welcome to download it and hand it out. We have it available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese, and it breaks down the tips for being able to modify breastfeeding techniques to make it easier for babies with Down syndrome who have that hypotonia. And there is a whole book now on breastfeeding and Down syndrome. We love this book so much. We just purchased copies of this at our program. And when we go to see new babies, we deliver this just to take away that search and that financial cost for families so that they can consider breastfeeding. And again, you can search for that online or see the URL here at the bottom. It's important for all babies, particularly babies with Down syndrome, to have a hearing test before they are sent home from our newborn nursery. And that is because babies with Down syndrome could be born with conductive hearing loss, central neural hearing loss, or a mixed hearing loss. And since hearing is so important for speech development, we wanna make sure we are up on that. The American Academy of Pediatrics wants the next hearing test at six months, 12 months, and then every year for the rest of their lives. But we wanna make sure we get that good hearing test and if it's not um, passed, then make sure that they have appropriate follow-up. Every newborn with Down syndrome needs an exam, a full exam, and we want to make sure we're seeing two red reflexes, because if there's one eye condition that can emerge right from the get-go, it would be cataracts, and we want to make sure we detect that. If you do see a non-red reflex or that white reflex, you want to make sure you have ophthalmology consulted or referred to ophthalmology immediately thereafter. Otherwise, all babies with Down syndrome after they get discharged will have their first eye exam around eight to 12 months of age. And then we arrange that every year up until uh, five years of age. And then we could graduate them to a more uh, lax schedule if no eye conditions are found. Thyroid, as we know, goes along with that extra chromosome. If on your newborn screen, they already screen for thyroid conditions, that is great. It's just following up with that. If they don't or it takes too long for those results to get back, all babies need to have their thyroid tested um, at birth. And that is because there could be congenital hypothyroidism or rarely congenital hyperthyroidism. And it's so easy to treat. We just wanna make sure we don't miss it. And then those of us who continue to see them will continue to check their thyroid at six months, 12 months, and then every year for the rest of their lives. We know if there's too little or too much, we have a way of treating it. And then there's this third category of compensated hypothyroidism that we're increasingly being proactive in treating. Cardiology, I'm preaching to the choir, is so essential. So the recommendation is whenever resources are available within your hospital, and of course they are at Cleveland Clinic, call for a cardiology consult within the first 24 hours of birth for all babies suspected for or confirmed to have Down syndrome. Cardiology will help arrange for that echocardiogram regardless of whether you appreciate a murmur. As my cardiology friends have reminded me, if you don't hear a murmur, that either means the uh, there are no cardiac defects or there is a big whopping cardiac defect. Um, and so we need to make sure that we get that echocardiogram. And while we're waiting for that to happen, our cardiology friends oftentimes like us to jumpstart that um, workup and get that initial EKG for extremity blood pressure and pre and postductal saturations. Before a baby with Down syndrome goes home in our newborn nurseries, we just want to make sure that GI system is working from mouth to anus. And the best way to do that is to observe the baby eating and to make sure we have a stool come out the other side. And that is because babies with Down syndrome can have a kink in their GI system at any point along the way. You have esophageal atresia, TEF, you have a duodenal stenosis, which you could see here. So of course we have the stomach connecting to the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum, but the reason why we have an air bubble is, is we have a steno stenotic part in that duodenum and we have the classic double bubble. Um, annular pancreas where it could wrap around the intestines. 
The small intestines could be fine, but then you get to the large intestines and if it's not innervated, you're gonna have stool that backs up or stool that might not come out. With Hirschsprung's disease, sometimes there is anal atresia or stenosis and imperfect anus, and oftentimes there will be reflux in babies. So the GI system um, needs to be evaluated and if the baby is not able to swallow and stool, we wanna make sure we get that workup to make sure that all of the things are connected properly. Prior to discharge, we want to make sure babies with Down syndrome are safe to go home. Because of that generalized hypotonia, some babies with Down syndrome have difficulty controlling and lifting up their head. So we want to make sure we do that car seat test prior to discharge. And if that test has failed, then we want to make sure we arrange for a car bed for safe transportation home. This is a great pamphlet, which you could download here that we give to all of our newborn families so they can understand car safety specific for children with Down syndrome. We like to help parents out before they go home. Let's take one call away from them. And we know babies with Down syndrome by the diagnosis are automatically eligible for the federally funded and the locally supported early intervention programs. This is where they're going to get physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. If we make that phone call, it takes away that initial burden from family. So one to two weeks after returning home, they're going to start to have the physical therapist or the developmental specialist come to the home to be able to provide that needed early intervention. And you can find your local EI provider at this website right here where you can search for by state. I've said over and over again, there's nothing that makes our jobs better than being able to be connected with a Down syndrome organization. And you all know, and I hope you know, how lucky you are to have the Down Syndrome Association of Northeast Ohio in your backyard. They are amazing. They're there to help you with families prenatally, postnatally, and immediately after birth. We have several people on the line today joining us today. And if you haven't checked out their website, please go here. Amazing organization in your backyard. And here you go. I was asked to make a YouTube video because I guess people are going online. So this is a short five minute video. If you think it could be helpful, anything families need to know in the first year before they dive into those long books, feel free to share it if you think it could be of help to families. Finally, connecting families with clinical experts. They're about to leave your newborn nursery. Where can they find support? We have 71 Down syndrome specialty clinics in the United States, and you are very fortunate to have one at your very own Cleveland Clinic. And I hope you know about them, Dr. Wong and her whole team there. You could uh, visit the Center for Down syndrome. Here's their website. Please do connect with them because I know they want to be partners with you for all new babies with Down syndrome. In the last section of my talk, before I take your question, I wanna share with you a new program that we have launched for those families after they've been discharged from our hospital who may or may not have access to a Down syndrome specialty clinic to make sure they're getting all the up-to-date information on Down syndrome. It's something we're calling Down syndrome clinic to you. It's launched, it's live, and I wanna show you how it works because our whole goal is to democratize healthcare for people with Down syndrome. So there are no haves or haves nots. They're not people who have the latest information or don't. There are families who are lucky enough to be in your backyard, in my backyard. But what about the 95% of families in the United States who don't have access to a Down syndrome specialty clinic. So my team at MGH worked for six years to create this new online program, but we did it with the help of national advisors. So we have our national experts here, Marilyn Bull, many of you know, wrote the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines. Brian Chicoin wrote the uh, book for adults with Down syndrome. We worked with many primary care providers, and of course, we involved parents because nothing about us without us, and we wanted to make sure what we were creating would be something that would resonate with the modern day parent. I wanna show you what it is. So if people go to our website, downsyndromeclinic2u.org, there is an intake form, and essentially families could complete as much or as little as they want. It is built for those who have loved ones with Down syndrome between the ages of one all the way up to senior age. And that's because it has branching logic. So after the first section here, the system will say, oh, should we ask the 35-year-old questions about Down syndrome or should we ask the four-year-old questions about Down syndrome? So we ask the questions that are the most specific to give us the answers. It is mobile optimized. You can complete it on your phone, on your iPad or your computer, and there's no fill in the blanks. It's all check, check, check. And that's because it is built on algorithms. You know, at the end of the day, I've been privileged now to have seen thousands of patients with Down syndrome with my colleagues. And at the end of the day, I am just a glorified pattern recognizer. 
If someone says I have an eight-year-old with Down syndrome who's snoring at night and tired during the day, I've just learned those three variables likely mean obstructive sleep apnea, and I'm going to tell you we need to get a sleep study. You don't need to make an expensive visit to my Down syndrome specialty clinic for me to tell you that. So with all the guidelines we have out there, with all the evidence-based medicine, can we distill that into algorithms? And with our national advisors, we spend two years turning all of our thought processes into algorithms so that as a family goes through and enters data here and then they press submit, no human being is going to review it because we're trying to create something that's scalable. Instead, it will initially ping off these algorithms that are constantly fine-tuned and updated to give them a checklist. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So here are all the medical concerns that either in solitude or in combination lead to something that's Down syndrome specific. This is also fully translated into Spanish to make it accessible. And chapter number three on the left here is all of the behavioral issues that sometimes we see in toddlers and adolescents that sometimes will add up to a co-occurring diagnosis. Down syndrome and ADHD, Down syndrome obsessive compulsive disorder, Down syndrome and autism. Being able to make sure we don't have diagnostic overshadowing. Oh, I just see Down syndrome. No, how do we see Down syndrome and depression, Down syndrome and ADHD to make sure that people with Down syndrome get the same adequate treatment as those without Down syndrome. Families could complete as much or as little as they want. You could see we have the different sections listed here on the left. If they do happen to complete the nutrition and swallowing questions, it will be as though they saw our Down syndrome nutrition specialist in person. There are some unique nutritional needs for people with Down syndrome. We wanna break those down and make sure the content gets to those families regardless of where they live in the United States. We're gonna ask about blood work and diagnostic testing that's been done already. The last things parents want is, hey, you need to go get your thyroid checked as a recommendation when they just got it checked two months ago, right? And just as much as our in-person Down syndrome specialty clinics are more than just medical clinics, we talk about education. We talk about how best to um, teach math to people with Down syndrome. How do you get a job when you have someone with Down syndrome? What is an ABLE account? If my child with Down syndrome outlives me, how do I set up life plans for myself? How do I give information to the other brothers and sisters? That is all built in here as well. So you can see there's a section about schools and therapies, life skills checklists, and also resources in the Down syndrome community. Do you know about this Down syndrome organization or not? When a family gets through all of this form and they press submit, again, they will immediately get access to their password protected personal portal. And this is gonna be a web page, but I took some screenshots to give you a flavor of what this looks like. And you can see here that the family will have an immediate access to the checklist for them. What are things that they could do right now as caregivers at home to make sure their loved one is maximized on their health and wellness? And then they could click on tab two to get the same recommendations, but now written in doctor talk. So when they go to the next pediatric appointment, that annual appointment, they could come with a checklist so we could turn every primary care physician into a Down syndrome specialist. In the upper right-hand corner with a click of a button, everything is translatable into Spanish, and then they can download things into a PDF if they want to print and or email it as an attachment to the healthcare providers. So let me walk you through what would be on this checklist for our sample patient, Molly. The first section are gonna be labs, tests, and procedures. They're all built on the backbone of those AAP guidelines and based on research. You can see based on how Molly's mom's uh, responded, she needs an eye exam, she needs a celiac screen, she needs a sleep study, right? And so on and so forth. There are families who have told us, if you're gonna tell us why, if you're gonna tell us this needs to be done, I wanna know exactly why. And so after each recommendation, you see you have this green Y button. And if someone were to click on that green Y button, there would be a box that would expand that would say, here is what you wrote that led us to give you this recommendation. So for thyroid, for a sample patient, you indicated in the past 12 months, Molly has not had her thyroid levels drawn and individuals with Down syndrome have a significant risk of developing thyroid problems, which are important to treat. Experts recommend that everyone with Down syndrome have their thyroid levels checked annually. And now that we're talking about thyroid, we also spent um, three years and we continue to update it, 
any medical information that's credible on the internet, we have now curated to deliver when they need it. So now that we're talking about thyroid, if they click on this first link here, it will take them to our colleagues at Boston Children's Hospital that has a great free webinar about thyroid and Down syndrome. It's always been there, but no one knows to look for it, right? And now we're gonna deliver it. Or if they click on the next link, it'll take them to one of the national Down syndrome organization pages where they can learn all about thyroid issues and Down syndrome. The next section is about the co-occurring conditions that go along with Down syndrome. There are hundreds that we've had to learn, but now we're going to call out those that might be present for Molly, tell their parents why, and give them access to those resources. So Molly might also have depression. Here is a great book that they could get. And in chapter 14 of this book, this talks all about what we think she needs to know. Just as much as our in-person clinics are more than medical clinics, we talk about health and wellness. Molly is older. She wants to learn about how to date, social boundaries, about puberty and sexual development. She wants to learn about OCPs. All of that will be factored in if she wants it. Based on how Molly's mom responded, here were some of the various among lots of nutrition recommendations that could have been outputted. You can see here she needs more calcium and there's links here to take her to recommendations. For those who are 12 and older, in order to help them make the transition to adulthood, we have broken that down step by step. And you could see here that Molly wants to learn how to use public transportation. She wants to tell the difference between a stranger and a friend, all these skill sets among many that she wants to build on. But there are resources. It's not just, oh, that's great, you want to do it. Well, how are you going to learn to use public transportation? If you click on this resource, here is a free social story, a workbook that you could download to begin to use. And again, it's always been there, but we're delivering it when they need it. How best do you teach math? How best can we improve speech? Molly wants a job. How do you even go about getting a job? What are resources available? Again, all the links there. And then all of the Down syndrome organizations, if her mom wants to learn more, what is social security? How do I get that? What's an ABLE account? Again, anything that we would tackle perhaps with our social worker can all be programmed in based on age and interest and a click of a button will translate it into Spanish. Back at the portal, if her mom were to click on number two, the primary care plan, it's now gonna be those same recommendations but written in doctor talk. So when Molly goes for her annual appointment with her doctor, she could share this with her doctor and we hope to make the doctor's visit a little bit easier to be able to say, here are the things that will bring her up to date based on guidelines and based on the latest recommendations. We've also created a micro page for primary care physicians with a link to all of the references that have been programmed into Down Syndrome Clinic to you with a listing of which of those handouts or references have been given to your patient. We also tested this in a national randomized controlled trial and our results have been published. And over a year and a half, we followed individuals who use Down Syndrome Clinic to you and we were able to prove if it's effective, families liked it and primary care physicians said, thank you. Um, we have one or two patients with Down syndrome, and it is unreasonable, if not impractical, to stay up to date on all the Down syndrome guidelines, and so this makes the job a little bit easier. After we were done with the research, we then launched it as a publicly available website due to philanthropic funding we got from this Down syndrome organization. It's now available. If you pull out your phones and you want to bring it up, I don't mind. Um, you can find Down syndrome clinic to you. This is what it looks like, available in English and in Spanish. It's available at three low cost options for families, one time use, $49, you get your results. Those are your results for a lifetime. If like a gym membership, you want to have it for a whole year. So anytime you have new symptoms, you wanna ping the system and get new updates, it's for $89. And an annual subscription is, you can ping it as much as you want, but you just sign up for year after year renewal. Um, we know that a lot of Down syndrome organizations are now wanting to give the gift of health to their members. So on our website, we have a list of the organizations that are offering codes to make sure their members don't even have to pay those low costs. And we're also continuing to work with insurers. This is where I spend a lot of my time trying to make sure that Down Syndrome Clinic 2 gets covered. And it's a win-win because insurers know that this will keep people up to date on their health care uh, maintenance, reduce costs overall, and make sure that we empower care to shift from high cost specialty clinics into cost effective primary care settings. And we have a list of insurers online that cover it. I need your help. Um, if you could spread the word, many of us are connected online. We really need to get the word out. It's just our small little team trying to get this information out. So anything you could do to share it with people in your area, I would be so grateful. I can't thank enough all of the people in my life who have 
enriched my life and also made the research possible, including people listed here. And I cannot and would not do this without collaboration. And so please reach out to me through any of the mechanisms listed here if you think there's a way that we can continue to work together. And I want to end by thanking uh, both of my sisters, but particularly Kristen, my sister with Down syndrome, who is an Ohioan, who is again to thank and blame for all of my professional passions. Thank you again for joining me for this presentation. Um, and now I would love to hear your questions.